Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ed Keystone. Uh, Ed is chairman of the Canadian Rheumatology Research Consortium. He's clinical director of the Canadian Arthritis Network. He's professor, Department of Medicine, University of Toronto, uh, director, of Division of Rheumatology um, of the, is this true, Cleveland Clinics of Canada? Okay. Um, He's director of the Re Rebecca McDonald Center for Arthritis and Autoimmunity and the Center for Advanced Therapeutics in Arthritis. Uh, he received his bachelor's in medical degree at Toronto and then he was an intern at Toronto General, a residency at the University of Michigan uh, and Sunnybrook. And then he was an Arthritis Society Fellow uh, in the Rheumatic Disease Unit in Toronto. Um, he's uh, won the Grand Master Award of the American College of Rheumatology. He's on the editorial board of more than 10 journals and a reviewer for many more. Published more than 200 peer-reviewed uh, articles, nearly 100 books, book chapters, reviews, or invited papers, more than 350 abstracts, numerous appointments on biopharmaceutical advisory boards, currently the co-chair of the Mount Sinai Clinical Trials Working Group, and he's going to talk this morning about recently approved and emerging therapies in RA. Well, first of all, uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here today. It is a great pleasure coming from Toronto and coming to Florida. It's even more of a pleasure. Um, and I would just want to start first with, uh, hold on, I'm going to go back. These are my uh, disclosures. Now you see them, now you don't. Um, I have uh, another disclosure. Uh, this is actually a, a quote from a famous individual. And here it is here. Mark Twain says, there are two kinds of lectures those that are nervous and those that are liars. I just want you to know that I'm not nervous, okay? <laughs> just want to make that very clear. I also want to tell you that I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. <coughs> Excuse me, I, I, I don't have tuberculosis, HIV, or anything like that. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, particularly because of the flight that I had yesterday from Toronto, or the two flights from yesterday to Toronto. It was about eight hours to get here. It was interesting, because if you take a direct flight, it's three hours. So when I say I'm glad to be here, the truth is I'm glad to be anywhere. So just want to make that clear to you as well. Okay, so what am I going to do today? So uh, here we are. Uh, here's the outline. Basically, the outline says uh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Number one, I said I'm going to talk about issues related to the more, I say, recently approved. But in the United States, of course, they've approved for five years. In Canada, we, you know, we're like the post office. We just got them approved recently. Uh, that's what I mean by uh, recently in Canada. Um, the point is that I'm going to talk about issues related to galimumab, sertilizumab, uh, and also to tocilizumab. Issues. I'm not going to go through all the data because that's boring. I'm just going to tell you some of the stuff that people talk about in relation to these therapies. And then um, I will talk about sub-Q abitacept. It's not a batacept. It's not a shoe. There's bata shoes. This is abitacept. And then finally, uh, or second, finally, I'm going to talk about anti-IL-17, and I just want to say you won't see any slides because my new computer that I got yesterday ate them. So uh, since they ate them, I'll have to do it off the top. Hopefully I have a, a little bit of knowledge left. And then finally, obviously, I'm going to talk about really the most exciting area these days, which are the signal transduction inhibitors or the JAKs, you know, JAK, STAT, um, and uh, SIC kinase. So those are the things we're going to talk about. Well, let's start with the issues related to recently approved therapy. So first is galimumab. And what's the issue with galimumab? Well, it's easy. The issue is this. Failure, at least in one trial, the go-forward trial, post-methotrexate, to inhibit radiographic progression. And everybody saw that and said, oh my god, this can't be a very good product. There's no inhibition of radiographic progression. But in fact, there's a good reason why there wasn't particularly in this trial. And the point uh, this is, by the way, there's the data. On the left-hand side, the placebo, and then you see two doses, the 1,500 milligram, and virtually they look the same in terms of inhibition of radiographic progression. They look the same because there's no placebo response. That is, the placebo did as well as anybody else. So the question is, why would that have happened? Well, it's kind of interesting. The reason is the criteria they use for the clinical trial. In most clinical trials, you have to have four tender, four swollen, uh, six tender, six swollen, and then you have to have an elevated ESR, more than 28, elevated CRP greater than 1.5. With those criteria, the placebo progresses radiographically. 
Well, here are the criteria here. Never been done before. And the criteria are simple. Four tender, four swollen. No problem with that, really. But then you had to have two out of the other four criteria. And notice that, you know, sure, you had to have erosions, maybe, rheumatoid factor, maybe, morning stiffness, maybe. And you may or may not have an elevated ESR or CRP. This is the first trial that said, don't worry if you don't have it, we're not going to worry about it. Well, the truth is it did matter, and that was the problem. Because, in fact, if you look at the, um, the uh, criteria, not the criteria, but the observations, at least in terms of the baseline disease activity, most clinical trials have 30 tender, 20 swollen joints. Well, this one's 24 and 12. A little, a little less, you know, half the number of swollen joints. That's okay. The DAS score in most trials, you know, VAS is DAS. You know, the DAS score, you heard about VAS is DAS. Well, the DAS score usually is about 6.5, 6.6. This one is about here, I think it was 6.6, 6.0. And the HAC scores, which are usually about, you know, 1.6, 1.7 was about 1.4. But most importantly, most CRPs, most CRPs run around 1.3, 1.5, up to about 3.5. Notice the CRP on the right-hand side is 0.9, with a normal of about 0.8. And the message here is that the CRP wasn't elevated and they had a, a lowish joint count. Who cares? Well, the answer is that if you're going to progress and you ask what are the best predictors of radiographic progression, it's swollen joint count and CRP. So if your CRP is low and your joint count is half of what we usually see in clinical trials, at the end of the day, you're not going to get very much progression in the placebo, therefore you can't compare it. Now, it's interesting that they did MRI studies, and the MRI studies show here. On the right-hand side, you see synovitis, and there's an improvement. The placebos, you know, the left-hand bar, and you're sure enough, there's synovitis improvement, uh, improvement in joint space narrowing. But it's interesting there was no improvement in erosions on the MRI. The reason for that? Not entirely clear. And then you said, okay, that's one study. There was another study which is called the GOBI-4, and in the GOBI-4 study, this was the early study, right? It was combination versus monotherapy, et cetera. So it was like, you know, the Tempo, the Premier, and all the others. And the question is, what happened there? So the GOBI-4 is here, and here's the results this time. Just look at the bottom. This time, in fact, the CRP wasn't 0.9, but for whatever reasons, same criteria, it was about 1.3, 1.4, and the swollen and tender joints were still about what they were before. There was a higher DOS score, there was a higher HAC score, but the important point is these patients, for whatever reasons, it's early disease, were more active, and therefore, of course, when you looked at the placebo on the left-hand side, indeed, there was progression, radiographic progression of the placebo relative to the others. So the message, as far as I'm concerned, is the reason why you didn't get radiographic progression was because the placebo did not progress, because the swollen joint counts were generally lower, and in particular, the CRP was almost normal. Under those circumstances, you will not uh, have very much progression. So, I mean, and all the other companies, you know, they see this, and then every other company other than Senecor says, oh my God, this is a terrible product. Look at the results. It didn't inhibit radiographic progression. And I think what you have to do is take it with a grain, realize that they didn't use criteria that we normally use, and therefore, quote, they got burnt. But the MRI did show at least some inhibition of radiographic progression, and I wouldn't be surprised. It's a TNF inhibitor after all, and right now there's not a lot of data saying that one TNF inhibitor is different in terms of inhibiting radiographic progression. Okay, so that's the first comment. Second comment, sertilizumab. Two comments about sertilizumab that people talk about, at least we talk about. You may not, I know you're not going to talk about this stuff, but we talk about it, so I'm going to tell you about it. So here's the issue, two issues. Number one is that the effect size, what's the effect size? It's the ratio of the active agent to placebo. So it says the effect size with sertilizumab or simsia, simsia is bigger than almost any others. So the ratio, you know, divide one to the other, it's much better. And every, almost every meta-analysis, you know, meta-analysis, you take all the, the trials, you throw them in together and you get some data. It's all done mathematically. Half the time you don't understand how they did it, but they did it. And sertilizumab, Simsia, almost comes out every time more effective or at least secondly effective. Secondly, that's a Canadian term. We don't use that in America. But anyway, secondly, 
uh, it comes out first or second. You say, God, this must be so much better than everybody else because